Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I uh, have been uh, building MakePad for almost 10 years now in various languages. Uh, JavaScript, Rust, um, la lately. I will go through that. Um, I don't know how many of you here uh, know Rust. Have, have you written Rust? Have you interacted with the Rust ecosystem? So um, uh, Rust is a compiled language, um, unlike JavaScript, which is uh, uh, well, interpreted at runtime. Um, but uh, Rust is essentially like C++, uh, but it is uh, safe. So no more pointer errors, no more memory issues. Um, but it, it has uh, static memory. It doesn't have a garbage collector, so it has static memory management, compile time. And uh, one of the things that uh, is difficult in Rust is compile time of the applications that you build. Because uh, the Rust ecosystem um, has Cargo as their NPM, right? Or whatever, package manager of, uh, of, uh, of components. And uh, because everything is compiled um, and people start to, you know, add left pad and that kind of stuff, uh, it quickly uh, snowballs. So one of my challenges with, uh, with building MakePad uh, is keeping compile time low. So uh, this is a, a base model M2 uh, Air. It has 8 gigabytes of RAM. Um, it's, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, very low end, if you would say. The, the CPU is not low end, but um, effectively it's a, it's a, it's a budget, uh, budget uh, machine. And um, I'm going to uh, recompile everything. Hold on, power save. Recompile everything from, uh, from scratch. So we're doing a, doing a cargo clean. This means uh, a, a clean um, your build. And then I'm going to run MakePad Studio. Ignore the warnings. It's uh, all in the middle of development. Um, so this is a, a, a clean build of, uh, of my I IDE, right? So this was it. It's a clean build of a native uh, desktop IDE. This is a native window. It's running uh, directly on uh, Metal on Mac. It runs on OpenGL on Linux, and it runs on DirectX on Windows, and on WebGL on Web. Um, but here we have um, MakePad Studio. This is the IDE that we're building. You have to imagine this is like our Xcode or whatever, Visual Studio, but we're building it for Rust. So we're building uh, Xcode for Rust, if you will, or Visual Basic for Rust. And uh, as I always like to do is uh, I like to run my own uh, slides inside, uh, in sli inside MakePad. Right now I'm uh, compiling, uh, also everything is, uh, is, uh, is clean, so uh, it's now recompiling uh, from scratch all the dependencies of uh, my slides. Here we have uh, my slides. I will uh, open the slides application here and uh, as you can see, uh, wait, something is broken. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I think uh, compiling everything from scratch, uh, scratch uh, swapped uh, out uh, a MakePad, so it hung a little bit because it had to uh, get memory back from the system. Uh, but yeah, here we have uh, live coding. Um, uh, this is my slides application. This is a, a real application. It's running inside the IDE now using cross-process uh, texturing, which uh, is actually uh, similar to how a browser is architected. So the child process is now inside the IDE. That means that if I change uh, the code or the Rust code, it doesn't open a new window. But for the presentation, it seems nice to run this uh, full screen. So I'm going to open the slides um, as an application. So now it's a, a normal full screen application, which I can then full screen. And now we have slides. So uh, yeah, live application building with MakePad. I, uh, um, I want to talk about what we lost over the years, right? I'm old. Um, I grew up with uh, the home computer boom. And then uh, we got uh, uh, QBasic, then we got Visual Basic, Visual C++, Delphi, or Delphi. And all of that somehow magically uh, disappeared over the years. And what we got back is uh, typing HTML by hand and uh, broken visual, visual editors. 
Um, so I was always keenly aware of, of that we lost something. And uh, of course, there's been many uh, projects going on, like no-code HTML stuff, but it never really captured, uh, um, captured the power of, 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 for instance, Delphi again. So a very long time ago, I built a startup called Cloud9 IDE. You might have heard of it, uh, uh, although uh, starting to become so long ago that uh, certain people in the audience uh, were uh, still in primary school when that happened. Um, and we built an HTML code editor uh, called Ace, and it was used by GitHub and Khan Academy, and, and that, that thing really went everywhere. Um, it, was a, it was a code editor in, uh, written in HTML. And um, so HTML as IDE UI, okay, that sounds like a stretch, especially at the time. Um, and um, we had a problem with, uh, with our workflow as a company, right? We had UI designers that were doing everything in Photoshop, and then we had a development team that would uh, turn that into HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And uh, that was a very difficult workflow because the designers could, you know, make stuff much faster than the development team could process. And at some point, I think we had a backlog of like six months of designs. Um, and also the, the interaction with, uh, with your product in terms of uh, uh, customer feedback was very, very slow, right? Everything the designer changed or tweaked or tried to make a landing page better um, it took a long time to get through the development pipeline. Of course, you know, with a lot of effort nowadays, you can set up A-B testing, you can have all this workflow plumbed away, but uh, that is a whole project on its own. And this was uh, 2010, so uh, cloud didn't barely exist at that time. Um, and um, also, I couldn't innovate the editor, right? Because we, we put all our effort into building an editor that was just passable, so just within the 16 milliseconds update time of the browser window. So everybody's like, oh, this editor is fast. Yeah, but this is it, right? We can't really put stuff in it. We can't make sliders, color pickers. All these things were too heavy. And uh, I, I, at the time, I was like, okay, can we make animated code folding? I thought it was a cool feature. Like, hey, can we do that? Um, so I tried to do that with CSS, and, and you know, it, it was just dreadful. The performance was in, impossible. And um, so I got really frustrated with HTML, very, very frustrated. And um, so I, at some point I, uh, I left the company and uh, started over completely. This was uh, 2013 or something. And uh, WebGL was just uh, two years old at the time, or I don't remember exactly how, how old it was, but very, very new. Uh, actually, you could blue screen a computer with it uh, back in those days. Uh, which is actually one of the main reasons that the uh, GPU APIs in the browser took so long. Because uh, Flash was first with uh, Flash uh, 3D or whatever. But at the time, GPU drivers were so, so all over the place that I think like one in five Windows computers would just blue screen if you tried to open a hardware context. Um, and, uh, but okay, this was getting better, right? We were at, uh, what is it? Uh, how fast were you? We were at Intel HD 3000 uh, chips at the time, and it was just barely capable of rendering UI in WebGL. So I was like, okay, um, what if we start writing shaders to style the UI, right? I don't know if you know Shader Toy. Uh, it's a, uh, a website where you can program uh, the programs that run on the pixel shader of the GPU. That's the part of the GPU that controls which color every pixel gets. And these, these uh, programs are essentially functional. So every pixel gets a function call, give me your color, and then you can write code in whatever way, even you can even write ray tracers in there, just as long as it doesn't need to know about neighboring pixels. It can't side talk, there is no side talks, because it always goes in parallel, right, conceptually. Not always, like little blocks run on one core, uh, but um, conceptually you have to think about that it runs in parallel. Because the fastest GPU nowadays has something like 16,000 compute cores, right? So 16,000 little computers, conceptually, that uh, run in parallel over your data. So I tried that and I tried it and I tried it again in JavaScript with WebGL and it took me a long time. Um, and I got here and I want to show you the final result of my JavaScript efforts. Some of you may have, uh, may have seen 
this at some previous talk, because I used to just give talks every, every year or so about, hey, this is where I am, what I'm doing. Um, so this is all uh, in JavaScript and WebGL. And um, it is actually a very fancy uh, thing, this code editor I've writ uh, written as well. Um, this code editor is a structured code editor. So it, it only allows you to write code in a certain structure. It, it, it doesn't allow for invalid formatting. So here, for instance, you see, if I press enter, this array switches between two formatting modes. And uh, it also has um, these programs that run on your GPU, but they're written in JavaScript. I transpiled the JavaScript to GLSL to do the styling. I thought that was a very cool idea to write the GPU programs in a, in a language that is, as, or syntax that is as close as possible to the host language, in this case, uh, JavaScript. So this looks like JavaScript, but it isn't. It's transpiled and you can, it doesn't have objects, for instance, right? It only has uh, uh, values, plain functions. So this, this looks pretty much like the code you would write in Shader Toy, except it had uh, some conceptual uh, changes. But the cool thing here is that we got, uh, let's see where my string is for MakePad here. We have full live coding here, right? This was, this was all hot loaded and it, this is running in a worker thread and, and it would update. So this uh, application um, essentially behaves like a micro operating system running in your browser. And uh, let's see if I give, can give you an example of how fast that was. Um, here were my sliders. So then, hold on, I've got to get this one. Um, so you could just like make, make many, 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 many more sliders. Uh, let's see. And then uh, just redraw it. Add some random noise to it. And but look at that, you know, everything is uh, running in parallel, and uh, and it and it doesn't bother each other. So uh, I even got as far as uh, running MakePad in MakePad. Because in the end, I was trying to make a real tool, right? I was trying to make a real tool. I was trying to make an IDE that I could use to build the IDE. Because otherwise, what are you doing? You're making a toy, right? Um, but what happened was, uh, at the time, uh, when you would code in this for half an hour, Chrome would just like sad face icon, right? You just, you think you can hot load JavaScript, but you can't do that for half an hour straight. These, these are not code paths that anybody uses for some reason. Maybe it's fixed now, but at the time, I ran into a big wall. A Safari kept breaking everything I did at every turn. Uh, and, and Chrome just, uh, yeah, just crashed. And I, I probably filed like two or three bugs uh, in Chrome over the years. And I still, I think I still get emails about one of them or two of them. And they're like, yeah, huh, yeah. Huh. So, you know. <laughs> 10 years? No, I'm not going to wait that long. So, uh, here we go. That was my final result. And of course, uh, we had live coding. That was great. But the bad part was um, it was even still too slow. This looks fast, but it isn't, right? It's using too much of that 16 millisecond window. Or at the time, we had 60 hertz. Now we have 8 because we have 120 hertz uh, or even more. Um, and um, it was still too slow. The, 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 the code editor just barely scraped by being able to do all these things. And, and that means that if you spend all of your uh, CPU budget on just drawing the UI, you have no CPU budget for using the CPU for what you built the UI for. So, okay. Um, and uh, another problem is that JavaScript I wrote had no types. I think TypeScript, uh, maybe, yeah, it started around that time. Um, and that meant that uh, I could about uh, write code for about six months straight. And then my short-term memory started failing about the beginning of that six months. So that meant that about every year or so, I pretty much had to do file new because I couldn't iterate on the code base. Uh, and uh, also the, all this visual stuff is hard to test and hard, and hard to evolve if you, if you clutter it with tests. I tried that, I couldn't do test-driven development with this very well, so I, I, I couldn't scale it. Um, so yeah, that was like, okay, cool. 
yeah, now what, right? You're, you're, you, I've spent so many years uh, trying to do this, and then, uh, and then it still fails, and I was pretty sad about that. So um, at the time, uh, my co-founder, current co-founder, Eddie, uh, worked at Mozilla, and uh, Rust uh, started, uh, uh, or it actually started longer, longer ago, but it started to become usable in 2018. Um, and uh, so, and it compiles to WebAssembly because I wanted the web deploy platform, right? Because it's great. You can send people a link and they can try it, right? That link that you saw for the uh, JavaScript thing, I think it still runs on an iPhone magically. Apple decided not to break it for some reason. And um, the, uh, uh, so I could do it with WebAssembly. You could compile it to WebAssembly, but it was a completely different language, right? You go from weekly type JavaScript where you can do everything, runtime, new functions, because the, the JavaScript code that I wrote has really a lot of optimizations. Like it dynamically co-generates all of those uh, drawing functions to make it as fast as possible. Because uh, yeah, in JavaScript abstraction costs uh, you uh, runtime, which is a really weird thing because that limits your ability to make things nice and reusable. So I thought, okay, let's do it over with Rust. And so I, I uh, learned, uh, learned Rust. Uh, I started writing Rust, uh, um, and it was really painful. It was really hard um, because you come from JavaScript, everything is weakly typed, and now you're in the complete opposite side of the world where everything is very strictly typed, almost Haskell-like typed, and um, uh, it's compiled, and uh, you also get nothing. You have to literally write everything from the platform layer on up. You, you're pretty much just, yeah. Um, but I got my performance back, right? This was like some magical weight was lifted from me. I didn't have to think in, in contortions, making my own code-generated, optimized JavaScript. Uh, LLVM took care of that. So all of a sudden, um, your brain power could be spent on better things than trying to pretend to be a compiler. And yeah, as I said, these slides are a MakePad app. Um, but since Rust is compiled, uh, would I lo lose my life coding? Because I really like life coding. I really like short iteration cycles. Short iteration cycles keep me happy. Um, and uh, I have to write all this code, so I might as well make something that I like. Um, so what are, uh, reiterate my goals, right? What do I want to make uh, in, this, uh, in, in Rust? Um, so first of all, I want to make Rust programming fun. And I think this is now at the point where it's almost a, almost a funny joke, because Rust programming is very painful. Um, or can be. Um, so I'm like, okay, uh, just like I try to solve uh, JavaScript and web by going, okay, we're, we're just going to try to make it as fast as possible. Uh, with Rust, my goal is making it as fun as possible because it's already fast. Um, and I want to bridge that gap. My original thing was, okay, how do we fix that workflow between designers and programmers, right? How do we, how do we make that how do we get the, the dialogue designer, official basic, back into, the, into a common workflow? Um, so I had to come up with a solution for the live coding, because Rust is compiled. No matter how hard you try, you're going to have to recompile, and that takes at the minimum about two seconds, right? And that's mostly spent in the linker. But um, yeah, it takes about two seconds to recompile a top-level application. Um, so, I had to come up with essentially uh, a new UI language. Like HTML and CSS are domain-specific languages for uh, structure and style. Um, I had to come up with my own because, uh, yeah, if you file new everything and you don't want to have uh, include an entire browser engine, which I really do not, because then I get all my old problems back, um, we do. Uh, we do it with a new language. So MakePad Studio is the application that I'm going to show. Uh, you, can, uh, you can clone this repo if you want. Uh, you can run it. Um, just like I just showed you, you can compile it. Um, and uh, let's see. So I'm going to show you. Let's see. Yeah, let's look at the MakePad app um, and how it's constructed. Um, and, and so in, in, this, in this case, you have to let go of the idea that um, that this sits on, in a browser or, you know, the, there's literally nothing between me and, and the operating system, the platform, right? Every single thing that is in there, it's essentially pretty much building a new browser, but without all the baggage uh, that you don't have to take along. Let's see, a MakePad app. Uh, let's run 
I think we have a simple one. There we go. It's not too bad. Two seconds to, to run an application. This, by the way, uh, uh, one of the ideas uh, in MakePad Studio that is maybe different from other IDEs. Essentially, you turn on an application and it auto rebuilds. So um, you don't build it manually anymore. You just turn it on and it will automatically uh, recompile and update. So um, we have simple app. Um, yeah, I won't go into uh, too much detail, but um, here you have uh, essentially uh, my HTML, right? It is, uh, I don't know if maybe the font needs to be bigger. The, um, uh, in Rust, you have something called macros. And macros in Rust are really powerful um, because it allows you to essentially say, hey, here uh, my macro starts. And then what follows pretty much only has to follow the tokenization of the Rust language. For the rest, as long as you stick with the tokens, like a number and an identifier and whatever, you can pretty much define your own language inside that macro. And the macro is implemented. Uh, uh, you have two ways to implement that macro. You, have, uh, you can write a Rust program that takes all these tokens and generates Rust in the compiler. Or you can write a, a declarative uh, macro structure that is inside just like a C++ template, sort of. Not really. Um, so in this case, the macro doesn't do anything. It just turns the, whatever code is below here into a string. And then at runtime, I parse it, just like an HTML page. Um, and as you can see, I uh, thought it was funny to hybridize HTML and JSON or JavaScript structure. This is a tag, but because I always hated the closing tag, um, I use curlies. So, um, And uh, you can write shader code inside this structure. So the styling, I think here you see... Right, this is the, this is the GPU program for... Um, um, for the background of the application. Just like a shader toy, you can write a ray tracer, you could write Doom in this little piece of code. I think it's on shader toy. I don't think that's a good idea. Your battery will drain very quickly because if you look at the CPU die, like the, the chip, the area of the CPU where the GPU is, is at this point in time more than half, I think. So that means that if you have a, a, a laptop with an output of, uh, or with a um, TDP of like 15 or 25 watts or something, turning your GPU full power really burns battery faster than anything you can do. So you have to be a little bit careful with what you do in these programs. Ideally, um, you write them as simple as possible. But it's fun that you can do all sorts of advanced things. Um, here we have uh, the UI. Um, it's very much HTML-like, um, except the big difference is that um, it has an inheritance model. So um, this window thing is actually a template structure somewhere else. And the only thing this, this, this object structure does is composite. So it just blends all the properties. It's essentially like CSS uh, property inheritance, except it's single. Uh, uh, single inheritance and not, and not a mix-in. You could see a CSS as a mix-in, right? You just gather properties from all over the place, jam them in one big bucket, and that is your drawing information for that div. Here it's the same thing, except it has linear inheritance, and the reason I, I chose and forced that is because um, it forces you in a more structured model. You always know where things are from because there's only a single line of inheritance. It, it does make it a little bit less flexible, but that just means that you need to make inheritance easier. So that's what I focused on. Inheritance is easy and it's really fast. So this inheritance is run at load time, not at runtime, right? Like with an HTML engine, that compositing of the CSS is done at runtime. Um, here, when I load this application, it expands all the inheritance. Uh, it's like prototypical inheritance, but run at load time because I can copy all these things together and get one big final object that contains all the properties. So that's how it conceptually is built. And then you have uh, your app. Uh, this is Rust code, right? This is, uh, this is pure Rust code. 
Um, Rust has traits uh, instead of uh, interfaces. So you can implement an interface for a struct. And that means that a certain, amount, a certain set of methods are implemented for that struct. And then you can use uh, that type, that trait type, to uh, provide uh, general functionality. So here, um, I have to, be, be, to make this app uh, live, to make, the ha make it have a live a UI, I have to uh, derive live on it. This is my trait. It's actually a set of traits that allow this language, this DSL, to be projected into a Rust data structure. It's essentially a deserializer. So um, this is the other type of macro in Rust. It is called a, um, a derive macro. Um, and you have to imagine that this derive macro is a little bit of Rust code that gets a reference to the token structure of what immediately follows, right? So um, I have a bit of Rust code that gets a reference to the token structure of this thing. So it can iterate all the, all, the, all the fields, all the properties in this struct and generate code for that, right? That's great because then you can actually implement uh, serializers and deserializers. This is a form of compile time reflection. Instead of with JavaScript where you would iterate over the keys of an object and then maybe do something with it, here at compile time you can generate code that, uh, that uses all these uh, named properties. And if you then implement certain traits for these properties or require that these traits are implemented, you can write a recursive serializer and deserializer based on your properties. Or, in my, uh, this is how, uh, for instance, Serde works. Serde uh, is, uh, is the uh, serializer, deserializer, crate for Rust. Uh, crate is the, is the module format. But you can, of course, also uh, imagine that you can write a deserializer for a DSL um, and co-generate that into, uh, into a binding layer. So that's it. There's no glue between the language and the Rust code. It's auto-generated with a proc macro, which is amazing. Like in C++, everybody is still trying to get here uh, with all sorts of weird tooling, uh, but never achieved it. And in Rust, this is normal. But it is a, a use case that uh, has to click for you because, it, yeah, writing these macros, you're writing uh, essentially a, a, a parser and you're dealing with ASTs of, of the Rust code, right? It is, it's, a, it's not trivial, but it, it's extremely powerful. And, um, yeah, then uh, this is the Rust code where, you, where I handle the events, like I click the button and the counter goes up. Um, and I struggled very much with making this user-friendly, um, how to write this Rust code, because um, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, right? And if you maybe remember that on click in, uh, in JavaScript, when you set on click, it closes over the variables around it, right? So you can always access things around it. Um, but if you have a language that doesn't have a garbage collector, um, um, it doesn't know how to deal with those objects around it because how long is the lifetime of these things, right? In JavaScript, the, um, the closure holds a reference to the variables outside of it. And when the closure disappears, like, you know, the object, the DOM object goes away or on click gets set to null or whatever, the, ref the references to the, those, uh, to the data disappear and therefore the garbage collector can then finally start throwing these away. But if you don't have a garbage collector, this is an incredibly complicated problem. So Rust does have closures, but it requires you to manually put ref count uh, wrappers around uh, your data to be able to deal with that. And then, because mutability is so managed in Rust, Rust has very controlled mutability. So um, this is to avoid data races and uh, to do safe multi-threading. We can do safe multi-threading in Rust. It's amazing. I can write a complete multi-threaded application in a day and I can almost be certain that it doesn't crash. Except if you do stupid stuff with multiple locks, don't do stupid stuff with multiple locks because it can deadlock. It cannot guard against the deadlock, but it can guard against uh, any, uh, any unsafe uh, data accesses. So the, um, uh, so that means that if you use closures in Rust, uh, accessing your data becomes uh, tedious to say the least. And I don't like tedious because that makes it difficult to, uh, if you want to mutate your data. So uh, how MakePad works is essentially that it is an immediate mode uh, event poll, right? You get a call, hey, there is an event. 
And then you just check which, which event it is in essentially a big switch statement with lots of ifs. Um, in this case, you, uh, you use a query, like we all remember jQuery. I actually think jQuery was a pretty damn cool idea. Uh, and it gets way too much uh, flack for being terrible because I don't think jQuery was terrible. It was the state management that people had to manually invent or route it. But querying a UI structure and, and functionally applying on selectors is actually pretty neat. Um, and because these two languages are in a different domain, I was like, hey, why don't we just uh, bring back some of that querying? So here, um, I query the UI for a button, for this button, and then I check if the button was clicked. And the good thing about this is that this is not an on-click callback, right? This is a poll. So this doesn't lock the, uh, the memory. It, doesn't, it, it cannot arbitrarily arrive at this, at this method from magically anywhere. The code flow always goes uh, straight through uh, the function. And it turns out that uh, because Rust is so fast, like if you would do this in JavaScript, you're going to have a bad time, right? If you have to pull your entire UI. Uh, but in Rust, it is super fast. LLVM just like squashes everything. If you cache the query on the top level node, um, I think I have in the order for MakePad Studio right now, I'm in the millisecond, one millisecond range to do all the event handling. And I'm also in the one, milli, one to two millisecond range to regenerate the entire UI. Sometimes uh, MakePad actually has incremental uh, update, but sometimes I uh, had a bug there and I completely forgot about it. And then at some point I looked at my CPU and said, this is a little bit high. I never noticed it. It keeps running 120 hertz. I never noticed it. I'm like, oh. We're regenerating the UI every frame. Oh, okay. Then you fix that. But you don't see it anymore because the uh, um, Rust is so fast. So this pattern is actually only possible uh, because of Rust. Okay, let me check the time. Am I? Oh, okay. Well, that's, uh, hold on. Yeah, 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 no, just checking. Like, um, it's hard to time these things. Um, let me open my presentation. No, not that one. Uh, make that slides. Let me quickly get back to, uh, to the story. Um, so, yeah, we have a MakePad app and um, what we also get is multi-platform because Rust uh, compiles on all these targets. Um, you, can, um, you can write the same program and run everywhere, literally. Like this is the Java dream, right? But you don't need the JVM. You can completely um, target pure binary code, right? Like if I build a, a, a MakePad application, the resulting binary in terms of entropy is around one megabyte. So if you compress it, it's about one megabyte. So we're back to, I think, WinZip or something, right? Like back in the, two, in the, zero, in the zeros, that's how big an application was, right? It only uh, C++ uh, uh, slow compiles started everybody piling in DLLs. That's why a web browser is also like 300 megabytes of, of binary code. But these applications are, yeah, like one megabyte again or two. Um, and uh, we can compile to WebAssembly. So uh, let's, uh, let's see that. Um, I think I can show you our synthesizer. Um, I, may, I try to make uh, uh, fun examples for MakePad so that people feel, uh, uh, feel excited about what you can do. So this is a little, uh, this is a little synthesizer. Um, this is now running uh, here in the IDE, but uh, I can also uh, compile WebAssembly. So it's going to compile it now. It's a little bit sloppy in terms of uh, some, some warnings and, uh, and things, but uh, the, um, the Rust compiler is now compiling its standard library completely specifically for WebAssembly, right? Can you imagine that, uh, that, that you know, your compiler can recompile its complete standard library with custom uh, flags? This is what it's doing right now because the WebAssembly build is using multi-threading and it's a bit, uh, um, it's a bit uh, new, I would say. So here we have 
the exact, exact same application using multi-threading uh, with, um, yeah, with, uh, with the WebGL UI um, and uh, um, audio threads. This is a completely threaded, uh, uh, threaded application. Um, so yeah, we get, uh, we get that and uh, recently I also, I'm not going to bother with real devices uh, for, for this demo, but uh, Ironfish it doesn't have a mobile UI, so it's not incredibly pretty. So here's my uh, phone uh, simulator. It's now uh, compiling, uh, there we go, do we work? There we go. No. It even has sound. It's amazing. So this is uh, this is the application running on uh, on iOS. You can also click uh, the real device if you have it plugged in. Uh, we have also have Android support. Um, uh, I completely stripped the Android SDK, threw away Gradle, and uh, made like a s complete selective installer that pulled in just the exact binaries that you need to build uh, an Android application. So. You can install the SDK in like two minutes on any new machine and then immediately deploy to an Android device. Got all that stuff, all that baggage we could get rid of. Uh, let's see, and then we have a fractal zoomer, which is also nice. So unfortunately my PC is not super fast here, but um, I can run this at 8K resolution in real time on an M uh, M1 Max or M2 Max. Um, and at 120 hertz. It's, uh, and this is running in a worker with worker pools and SIMD. So uh, it, it spawns up uh, 10 worker threads or on this poor little machine, maybe a bit less, maybe six. Um, and um, yeah, you can, you can still completely live code. Um, let's see, no, not Ironfish. Uh, here we have this is the this is the pixel shader I use to uh, to color uh, the shade the the fractal so you can just uh, you know write your own um, pixel shader for that. It is running the fractal computation on the CPU because it needs double precision float. Otherwise, you're going to run out of fractal very quickly if you use an F32. Uh, GPUs generally stop at F32 unless you have like one of those Nvidia cloud uh, uh, GPUs. Uh, but um, so that means that if you run this fractal actually on on the on the GPU, it, it yeah you can't zoom very far. So this is why this is kind of like a, it's implemented like a Google Maps uh, zoomer with tiles that get recomputed in a in a worker pool. But yeah, I, I wrote that worker pool in uh, I don't know half a day, and it doesn't crash. You know, in C plus plus, I would be like uh, trying to juggle chainsaw chainsaws to do this. Um, so yeah, we have a synthesizer, we have fractals, and uh, oh yeah, I also made, uh, of course, um, um, let's see, does it build? I made uh, an, uh, an AI explorer, right? This is a, a stable diffusion uh, XL with, uh, uh, with prompts, so uh, yeah, but you can finally see, oh, there's my camera. It also has uh, camera support, so you can real-time feed, the camera feed uh, through, I mean, maybe you've seen that those uh, videos go past on Twitter where people put a, um, a camera feed through an AI model. And I thought that was pretty, pretty cool to do. So uh, yeah, these are uh, all, uh, all AI generated, but I now have finally have uh, performance again um, in, uh, in, in building these kinds of UI. I think it took me a couple of days to build this application. Um, that's where I want to be, right? I want to have my computer back. I want to be able to make these little programs for, for the fun of it. Also that they're cool examples, but they're, um, if I had to do this in web, I mean, uh, this AI output, uh, outputs like 4K images at, uh, I think I got a throughput of something like six images per 20 seconds or something. Um, and then I, my directory, I copied the subset, but my directory is like something like 20,000 images. And yeah, no problem, you know, as long as you have enough RAM to, to cache some stuff, um, um, it just runs, it flies. And now, yeah, finally also, oh, webcam, sure. Uh, 4K, sure, no problem, you know, 4K webcam feed, do stuff. Because this is in no way different than OBS or other programs that use, um, use these APIs. Similar for the audio, 
I have a low lo level uh, audio API that is just as fast as Logic Audio or all these professional audio programs, right? On web, uh, we run the synthesizer, but when you play it with MIDI, you're like, ah, there's a bit of latency in there, there's a bit of latency in there. And it's true, the latency is actually of web audio is unusable in a professional context. But uh, yeah, with Rust, you can just do it. So now instead of uh, using uh, something like, um, 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 what is it, uh, Tauri or uh, that's the Rust thing, or Electron, where you get kind of the worst of both worlds, you get web performance as an un, uh, what is it, unupdated web browser, um, I can now uh, deploy to web for cool little demos, uh, but run the real code uh, natively. So yeah, I think uh, we're, uh, we're finally getting there. So maybe those five years uh, doing JavaScript uh, weren't wasted. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I showed uh, the multi-platform multi audio UI. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this talk is for something a bit longer. Uh, so wh why would you need this? Why would you want this? Well, when you actually want to do something with your computer in terms of fast compute, right? Maybe not a pizza ordering form, but something, uh, maybe data visualization or maybe, uh, you know, interacting with AI in a multi multimodal uh, form. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so one thing that I didn't show that we're currently still building, actually this whole IDE we're still building, it has a lots of, oh, and of course, I got my animated code folding. <laughs> you know, finally, finally I can do it again, or again, I can do it, unlike I couldn't. And I can uh, also develop MakePad Studio in MakePad Studio in MakePad Studio. <laughs> that, that third step never worked in JavaScript, but it does now. Uh, or maybe it did, I don't know. But it, uh, at least it's stable. I can work in this. This is a sub-process, right? I can, I can live code uh, the sub-process. And um, that, that, that live coding is, uh, is really very nice for my uh, let's see, app. Welcome to MakePath. I think it's here. Oh, this is my... Uh, this is my, um, my Apple menu. It also has support for Apple menus. This is why I like doing... It's just, just the same. I can live code the IDE in the IDE. Um, and it still compiles in, uh, in a very, very short time. So um, these are the links. I think uh, yeah, we can uh, end on that note if you're interested. Um, it's all MIT. Um, we're going to monetize uh, a Git client that is going to be an extension, also separate, uh, standalone. Um, or we'll see if we can monetize it. It's a, it's a, at least uh, you know IDEs uh, are uh, probably no longer in that uh, that idea that you can monetize it. Also, I don't think, um, yeah, this has enough barriers with Rust and with learning a new DSL that we're gonna need all the uh, adoption we can, we can find. So everything is MIT. You can, uh, you can fork it and uh, try to beat me, but uh, well, good luck. <laughs> I will explain it to you and I'll, I'll help you get started, but uh, it's, a, it's an endeavor. But yeah, thank you.